I, I don't think I have to state again, like how, how much of a growing concern cybersecurity is and being able to secure all of your customers' data. And so Cilium provides two kind of important things that I've seen a lot of customers um, and users switch to Cilium for. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I'm glad to have Bill Mulligan. Hey, Bill, how are you? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. That's great to have you here. We're going to talk about eBPF again. Now we're going to talk about Cilium. And the idea is to talk about scaling and securing Kubernetes, networking with eBPF and with Cilium. Welcome and tell, tell me what Cilium for someone that just got started on the cloud native space, how Cilium can help them. Yeah, so at a very high level, we like to say Cilium is eBPF powered networking, observability, and security. But the entry point that most people kind of first come in contact with is as a CNI. So in your Kubernetes clusters, right, we have a bunch of nodes trying to do, do work, but it actually doesn't come with any networking. And so into your Kubernetes cluster, you need to install a CNI or a container networking interface, and that does the pod-to-pod -pod connectivity. So at the most basic level, Cilium functions to be able to route packets between pods and let them communicate. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm going to share your, your screen here. I think you have the website from CDU open. And any the three like keywords there I can see networking, observability, and security, like you said. On on the security side, let's start on the I think the most important for me is the security side. How, how you see the security side? What's the difference from what existed before Cilium and now with Cilium? Sure. So there's a couple main reasons that I see people switching from other CNIs to Cilium or choosing it right out of the box. And security is a really important one. I, I don't think I have to state again like how how much of a growing concern cybersecurity is and being able to secure all of your customers' data. And so Cilium provides two kind of important things that I've seen a lot of customers um, and users switch to Cilium for. So the first one is around transparent encryption. Um, so a lot of um, people need to have either compliance requirements um, like HIPAA or um, they have regulatory requirements that they need to secure all data in transit. And so what Cilium allows them to do is essentially just with a flag, add encryption of all data in transit. So that allows them to uh, secure all their traffic with either IPsec or WireGuard, basically without any additional effort. So this company, Ascend.io, um, is a data um, pipeline company, and they wanted to be able to lock down some of their um, workloads. And rather than doing encryption with Spark, um, which actually failed a lot of times, and then they'd have to restart the whole job, which is a long time, like 12 hours, um, Cilium was able to transparently provide that um, and re reduce um, a lot of delays in their infrastructure. And then the other main security thing that I see a lot of people going to is network policy. Um, and so, right, in your Kubernetes clusters, uh, there's no kind of security out of the box. Any pod cannot talk to any pod. And so what Cilium allows you to do, it gives each of your pods kind of an identity, right? If we think about like moving, like um, the DevOps style, it's from like pets to cattle. And with cattle, you have kind of like a label of things. So our role can be like front end or back end. And with these Cilium identities, what you're able to do is define policy of who is able to talk to who. So you can say front end can talk to back end or front end one can't talk to back end two. And this allows you to really like lock down your clusters. So when people at a very high level like to think about things like uh, zero trust networking, so a default deny posture where no traffic is allowed unless, unless it is explicitly allowed. Um, a lot of people start to turn to network policy for that. And so what Cilium allows you to do is to define both Kubernetes network policies, which is uh, upstream Kubernetes, and also additional Cilium network policies to allow you to lock down your cluster in different ways. So this is things like FQDN-based policies, so being able to do it on a domain name rather than a specific IP, um, doing like host firewall um, network policies um, and additional ones too. So the two main security use cases I see for Cilium are around uh, encryption of network traffic and network policy. 
and also how eBPF plays, you know, a role on that to accomplish all these things. I, I, I'm guessing that eBPF is the main player on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think eBPF is a really exciting uh, technology. And it's kind of interesting to think about eBPF as a technology because it's now about 10 years old. Um, but because kind of like the kernel takes so long, uh, people don't put the latest kernel into production. It takes about that long to actually come into production. Right. And this is actually part of the problem why eBPF was kind of created is if you want to have something in the kernel, be able to modify uh, behavior of your I existing kernel, it could take years to have that functionality actually land. And so what eBPF allows us to do is to safely, securely, and in a performant way, insert essentially like little programs into the Linux kernel to modify the behavior. And so what this allows us to do is to add functionality on the fly. Um, you could do this previously with things like kernel modules, um, but those were kind of like unsafe to do because there's no guarantees that they wouldn't crash or otherwise harm the kernel. And eBPF has, if you look at this um, kind of slide, um, has a verifier uh, that basically verifies the programs won't crash or otherwise harm the computer before they're loaded into the kernel. And then it has a JIT compiler that allows them to uh, run the programs that basically natively compiled kernel speed. And so, you know, the Linux kernel is, is 30 years old. So some things, you know, aren't always the best ways to do things anymore. And what EPF allows us to do is insert little programs into the kernel to modify how things are done. And so actually, as one example, like how Cilium began was really in the, the networking domain. And so beginning kind of life as a CNI in Kubernetes. And so it was really built for the ground up on eBPF. And so what, for one example, allows us to do is to skip different parts of the Linux networking stack. So rather than having to go in and out through the whole networking stack, eBPF can actually take things um, right off of the, right off the host network interface and then redirect it directly to the pod. So it allows us to skip a lot of the kind of like latency and overhead of uh, traditional Linux networking. And so that's another reason that a lot of people start to turn towards Cilium is really this performance and scalability that it brings to Kubernetes clusters. Um, as you know, if you're running one or two nodes, maybe performance and scalability isn't your biggest concern. But as you start to get more complex use cases, as you start to bring more workloads onto Kubernetes, you really uh, start to care about performance and scalability. Some of our um, users, actually, we were just at KubeCon last week, and G. Rishuch was talking about how they have um, thousand bare metal node clusters, or and and up to ten thousand nodes. And then, so the question is, how do we make sure that still stays performant? And they really turned towards Cilium um, for its eBPF based networking to provide the scalability and performance that they needed in the Kubernetes clusters. Yeah, a lot of people. That's a that's a great great point. There. I think networking was the beginning when we start Cilium and um, and the project start growing and growing and and now we have those classes like you said with you know so many nodes and and Cilium is eBPF is allowing that to happen in a, in a certain way. And um, how you see that um, you talk about in this way scalability, but I'm assuming that. Using eBPF, you're also saving a lot of resources on those hosts and allowing more scalability and more compressing uh, the resource in a host itself. Yeah. Um, let me see. One of my favorite graphs um, is actually from a blog post that... Uh, one a an end user of Cilium does, and they decide to use Cilium for their layer four the load balancer to replace both their F five load balancers and their IPVS um, based load balancers, and uh, so when they're able to switch from IPVS to the layer four the load balancer with eBPF, they were able to essentially double their throughput, um, which is pretty cool. But I think <laughs> my favorite graph actually here is this one. Uh, when they switched to eBPF-based load balancer, they thought they actually broke um, 
their load balancer because the CPU load was so much lower. So they actually saved, it was 72x less CPU, um, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. It is great. Yeah, I'm assuming people forget about that, but it's a very, if we have a, a large cluster, could be a lot of money saving there uh, just doing that. And um, how you compare, like, only about costing, but it's also moving away from IP tables and other things that become like a bottleneck on those old clusters. If someone is running, you know, let's say Azure Kubernetes Service or any cloud uh, Kubernetes offer, and they want to migrate, how easy is that? Yes, there's multiple different ways to uh, migrate. Um, so the easiest one is to obviously just, <laughs> just spin up a new cluster, um, <laughs> right? Then you can install a new networking plugin, but that's not a realistic scenario for a lot of people. Um, so we actually had a blog post and they spoke with me on the stage at KubeCon too about how DB Schenker, which is a kind of like a uh, transportation and logistics industry company in Germany, migrated from Calico to Cilium. And the way that they did this is there's kind of like a new uh, thing in Cilium called the Cilium node config. And so you're essentially telling each node uh, what, um, what CNI they should follow. And so the way that it works is you can install Cilium in chaining mode. So you essentially have your existing CNI and you layer Cilium on top of that. And then once you have it on the node, you're telling each node, should it go with the original CNI or use the new Cilium CNI? And you can essentially roll over your whole cluster like that. So you tell each node, okay, switch from the old one to the new one. And then you eventually um, get, get rid of the old one too. And so they, you should re if you're interested in migrating from really any CNI, in this case, it was Calico to Cilium. Um, you should read through this blog and see how they did it. So they were able to do a live migration um, without any downtime too. Yeah, that's a good advice. Then for us to, just for us to conclude, like on the service mesh space, this is my question, if you can talk a little bit and also how people can contribute to the project is a project that is growing very fast, if ever where, it's become the default on Azure as well and all the clouds. Go yeah. on, you talk about C, uh, service mesh and, and what's coming next. Yeah, so service mesh, I think, is a bit of an interesting topic. Uh, having just been at KubeCon, you know, you ask uh, 10 people what service mesh is and you get 10 different answers. I would say the top use cases that I see uh, for like service mesh actually don't really involve a service mesh at all. Um, the number one is actually around uh, like meshing multiple clusters together. I'd say that was a huge topic at, uh, at KubeCon this time. And what Cilium has is called cluster mesh. And this is, allows us to do multiple things. So it allows us to put um, two clusters essentially into one network. Uh, one use case for this is to have essentially do failover. So if the backends die in one cluster, you're able to failover to uh, a different cluster, right? So you can have active, active, or act, active, passive, um, like disaster recovery. Another thing is around like service discovery. Um, so if you have multiple, if you have multiple clusters and say a service, like for example, a database is only running in one cluster, but you want to make it available in a different cluster, then with uh, cluster mesh, you're able to have essentially global services uh, that makes that service routable, even if it's not within that cluster. And Cilium does that all seamlessly and transparently to the user. So this is kind of like the multi-cluster routing. And then the other main thing I see a lot of people talking about for um, service mesh is really around like the observability aspect. How can we see what's happening on the network? And I mean, because debugging um, distributed systems is is something that's super hard to do. And so Cilium out of the box also provides uh, Hubble, which provides a service map of all your services. So how are things connected to each other? Um, where are packets being dropped? It can also do things like layer on top of that, the network policy, what is what what things are allowed, what things are not allowed, why is a specific service, service communication um, being dropped? and giving you really deep observability to enable, I see a lot of teams giving this to their application development teams um, to do uh, like self-service debugging of their applications. And so 
there's additional service mesh use cases. Um, a lot of them are going into Gateway API now, which is an upstream Kubernetes project. And Solium is conformant with Gateway, Gateway API and bringing that functionality back into the project. But I think um, really the multi-cluster and the observability building aspects are kind of two of the biggest ones um, that I see right now. And Solium provides those kind of out of the box as features. And I think kind of to sum this all up, like all of these features together is really why we're seeing Cilium kind of take over, um, like cloud native networking observability and security. It's become the default CNI for all the major cloud providers, including on Azure too. Um, there's Azure CNI powered by Cilium is now the default uh, one for uh, AKS clusters. And it's really great to see more of the upstream functionality coming into Azure CNI powered by Cilium. Um, actually, just last week, I saw that DigitalOcean also added more features to their um, Cilium managed uh, uh, their managed Cilium offering and Canonical with their um, uh, Kubernetes service just chose Cilium as the default CNI too. So it's really become the standard for how people do networking in the cloud native space. Yeah, for sure. And do you want to share... Um... Just open the, the GitHub page or just tell people how they can get started. Serious I sense a project. Um, how they can help, where they should get started. Is there is anything that you recommend for them to get involved with the project? Sure. So the easiest way to actually try out the project, I think, is actually here. Um, if you go to the homepage and click Start Lab, there's a bunch of uh, hands-on labs from around the community that can get you in a live Kubernetes clusters with Cilium installed, and it can walk you through some of the functionality. So that's a great way to kind of get your hands wet um, with, with the project in an easy way. And then on Cilium, or on GitHub, it's Cilium Cilium, um, and you can kind of uh, go through the, the project here. A uh, great way to get involved in any open source project is to go to the issues and then go to the good first issues too. Um, and filtering by that, you can see uh, features that the uh, or bugs that the community thinks would be a good place to to start in the community too. So I think those are both good places to start. And then lastly, if you have any questions, um, I'd recommend going to the Cilium Slack. There's over 20,000 people in there all looking to like learn about it. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And if you want to learn more, uh, go to the homepage, get started, get help, get involved. These are also great pages um, for people to start learning about Cilium too. Something new on Cilium. And it's nice to see that on Azure as well with Microsoft and all the, the main players on the cloud native space. See you next time. And don't forget to leave a star on the project and subscribe to the channel and follow the Open at Microsoft show. See you next time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye.